Okay. So let me introduce the first speaker now. So that'll be Roman Krems, and he will talk about you know, uh, collisions of, of molecules applying external and electromagnetic fields, also at cold and ultra cold temperatures. And I just want to make a comment. So he'll be doing dynamics in electromagnetic fields. As far as I know, this hasn't really been used in astrophysical models today. Certainly, you include magnetic fields in dynamics, gas dynamics, magnetic fields in spectroscopy. But I think it's really rare, I've never seen any, in which magnetic fields' effects on collisions have been included. Okay, maybe somebody knows it's been done. Okay, so without further ado, the next speaker is Roman Krems. Roman. Uh, as John used to say, there are good collisions and there are bad collisions. So <coughs> when I came here, one of the first problems that I uh, worked on was understanding mechanisms for the good and the bad collisions. And an example of a bad collision could be for molecules in a magnetic trap, could, would be the, the uh, collisions that would lead to the reorientation of the magnetic moment of the molecules. <coughs> so if you have molecules trapped in a magnetic trap, 
uh, they, they have their magnetic moment oriented along the magnetic field axis, if the molecules come together and preserve the orientation of the spin of the magnetic moment, then that's a good collision because that's the collision you want to equilibrate the kinetic energy while keeping the molecules in the trap. Now, if the molecules come together and change the orientation of their magnetic moment, they leave the trap because the molecules, once they flip the, 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 magnet, the orientation of the magnetic moment, you know, that they're going to be in, in the high field signal state, they're going to leave the trap. Okay. Now, John did the experiments with uh, the calcium hydride molecules, but then the question he had, you know, what about other molecules? Are they going to be stable uh, under collisions in magnetic traps? What about other kinds of traps? So to answer those questions, we had to develop uh, the theory of molecular collisions in the presence of external fields. Because you see, if you have molecules trapped in, in, a, in a trap, in a, any sort of trap, magnetic or electric, the field-induced perturbations are necessarily going to be larger than the kinetic energy of those molecules, right? So if you want to describe collisions of such species, you have to uh, have a theory that would include the effects of electromagnetic fields non-perturbatively. So that's what we set out to do. And and we developed the theory and the numerical methods to calculate cross sections and the cross sections and rates for uh, collisions of molecules in a in in electromagnetic fields. And and this is the paper that I think is the most important that, that I've used the most important paper of the ones I wrote when I was at ITAM. So that th this paper <coughs> basically describes the theory and, and the numerical methods that we developed. Now, having developed that, we had a tool to actually look at lots of interesting things. So we wrote many papers following this one, uh, you know, looking at different aspects of molecular collisions in, you know, in traps, molecular collisions in static fields, in even laser fields, etc. And I'm just going to quickly show you the, some of the most interesting papers, some of the papers that I think are uh, most interesting uh, that we wrote in those years. Okay, so this was one of the early studies and. Hussein, uh, 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 Hussein he was, was uh, uh, a co-author on this paper, and here I want to mention that you know uh, many people refer to coffee breaks as being one of the most important uh, you know uh, things at ITAM. Now, to me, what was even more important is the 4 a.m. discussions with Hussein. Because you know how you get to work in the morning at ITAM, and you get distracted by all those discussions. So my my typical day at ITAM would not begin until 5 p.m. or so. And it would, you know, end at 5 a.m. And Hussein would come to work at 4 a.m. So I remember, you know, usually talking to him for about an hour or so at at, at that time. And you know, you know, I would feel drowsy and you know, uh, and and sleep and and he'd come in fresh. And 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 that's when those discussions have, uh, you know, actually led to a lot of interesting ideas. So I found that morning hour to be the most productive in terms of. Uh, generating new ideas. Okay. But like I said, having well, the tool, you know, we, we, we had, you know, we had a, a numerical method at our disposal to look at many different problems. And again, I'm not going to go into details about what we did. Just going to show some of the most important uh, papers. So this is uh, another series of papers that we wrote in collaboration with John Dahl, or that's the work that was also stimulated by John Dahl. And in, in uh, this work, you know, he was looking at uh, the possibility of trapping not molecules but complex atoms like transition metal atoms or lanthanides in a magnetic trap. And of course, you know, no one knew what the collision behavior of those atoms would be in magnetic traps. So we looked at that. We, we, you know, we, we uh, did uh, you know very accurate of initial studies of those kinds of collisions. And you know, so these are the two back-to-back -back PRLs that we. Published and sometimes people ask me how I managed to publish two papers, you know, on PRL back to back with almost the same title. You know, one is clear than it was the one was experiment. So the, the series of work culminated in uh, uh, this paper, where we actually demonstrated both theoretical and experimentally how molecules like triplet sigma radicals, you know, uh, undergo their spin changing. Uh, you know, the, the spin orientation changes. In a magnetic trap. Okay. Now, the natural, uh, you know, path to go from there was to explore 
the use of electromagnetic fields to actually modify and control collisions. Okay, now, uh, so that, that's, that's what we went on uh, doing. Now, uh, before I, I uh, talk about this, you know, a lot of times, you know, when I mention this, people ask me, you know, why, why do you want to control collisions? You know, you know so sometimes people will just uh, give the possibility of controlling molecular collisions as a justification. But why, you know, if you could control molecular collisions, why, you know, what would it be good for? So I thought, you know, because this question comes up so often, I thought it would be good to, uh, you know, spend a couple of minutes uh, reflecting on it. Okay, so, well, first of all, you know, because it's a, it's a challenging task, right? So, and, and, and to illustrate that, that let me quote the abstract of Paul Brummer, and, and you may, those of you who don't know Paul Brummer, he's one of the co-founders of the field of coherent control or quantum control of molecular dynamics, uh, together with Moshe Shapiro. So in his uh, DAIM of, uh, 2007 DAIM of abstracts, he says that the experimental and theoretical studies of the coherent control of unimolecular processes have seen have spectacular growth over the past two decades. By contrast, coherent control of collisional processes remains a significant challenge. So controlling collisions, three molecular collisions, is a very difficult task, primarily because collisions are random, right? So if you wanted to develop quantum uh, mechanisms for controlling collisions, you'd have to be able to control not only the, uh, the relative orientation of molecules, but also have to have some, some handle on uh, the center of mass motion of the uh, collision complexes, which is you know, in general, a very complicated uh, problem. Okay, so molecules are moving randomly, they're rotating randomly, and that's what makes it hard uh, to control their interactions. Okay. Now, <coughs> the problem being difficult is not enough of a justification to study it, of course. So if you think about the actual physical applications of uh, external field control molecular collisions, you know, we could list a few. You know, the most obvious one would be to uh, seek ways for suppressing the bad collisions in the experiments like John Doll is doing, right? So if we could suppress those uh, uh, inelastic losses that lead to trapped losses, uh, that would, of course, uh, you know, be great for people like John Doll. And we actually wrote a couple of papers, you know, uh, proposing how to do that, okay? Now, uh, controlling collisions at low temperatures could also be exploited to study the effects of the global topology of the potential energy surfaces on, on microscopic scattering, unlike in some of those high energy experiments that probe on the limited range of the interaction uh, potentials. Okay, and of course what I find the most exciting is that uh, if you have a handle on controlling molecular interactions, you could study controlled chemistry at low temperatures. And again, you know, when I talk to chemists, you know, they, a lot of times they would ask me, you know, why do you want to study controlled chemistry? Why do you want to, want to control chemical reactions? I mean, like, by no means is this going to be a method to controllably synthesize something. You're not going to synthesize drugs in this way, right? But there's still a lot of value in uh, called controlled chemistry. And again, you know, I, I could uh, present you with a lengthy list of ideas of what could be interesting to the chemistry community uh, in this, you know, like for example, you could, well, quantum effects in chemistry are generally interesting, you know, there's a lot, uh, uh, you know, big effort in the physical chemistry community uh, towards understanding the detailed mechanisms, like the role of the individual row vibrational states of molecules in determining chemical reactivity. Uh, a very hot uh, research topic currently is the role of the geometric phase um, in uh, uh, in uh, chemical reaction dynamics, like if you have systems with conical intersections, you know, going around the conical intersection is going to produce the geometric phase. So uh, there, there are many theoretical papers out there that show, uh, the, that, 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 that illustrate the role of the geometric phase, but uh, there's no, as of yet, experimental proof or experimental evidence uh, for what the geometric phase may do to chemical reactions. And uh, again, you know, there's, we want to look at the effects of quantum statistics and many body interactions on chemical reactions. That's particularly interesting if you have cold and ultra cold ensembles of molecules. You could start talking about things like boson enhanced chemistry or chemistry driven by polar blocking <coughs> of particular reaction channels. Effects of tunable fine and hyperfine interactions. That's something that, that chemists couldn't have thought of, uh, you know, uh, normally because, you know, in, in typical chemistry experiments, the collision energies 
far exceed the, the uh, strength of the fine and hyperfine interactions in molecules. Now, if you bring the collision energy down to sub-Kelvin sub temperatures, sub, you know, the sub-Kelvin regime, uh, that's where those effects are going to start showing up. And then, you know, uh, you could look at that. Okay. So I, I, I was going to uh, show some, when am I supposed to stop, by the way? Just want to give at least 15 minutes. Yeah, I was, I was going to show a few examples <coughs> from, from our early work on this, but, but I thought, you know, I'm not going to do that. I, I'm going to point to, you know, if you're interested in the topic of controlled collisions, I'm going to address it to some of those uh, papers that we wrote over the years. And I'm going to spend the rest of my talk instead talking about um, the use of electromagnetic fields to uh, control uh, collective behavior of you know, molecular ensembles. So imagine uh, an ensemble of molecules, like I have three here, but it can be more than that, you know, uh, um, an ensemble of molecules, and they're all in the ground row vibrational state. And imagine now exciting one of those molecules, say rotationally exciting, to the first rotationally excited state. Now if the molecules are coupled, that rotational excitation is going to travel between the molecules. <coughs> now, of course, having done so much work on, on manipulating collisions with electromagnetic fields, it was easy for us to realize that those kind of processes, the energy transfer between molecules molecu you know, in, in molecular ensembles can also be, uh, uh, well, should also be sensitive to uh, external fields, right? Because ex external fields are going to perturb the molecular structure, they're going to perturb the intermolecular interactions consequently, okay? And now it turns out that, 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 that this can be interesting for a variety of applications. Okay, uh, one, one of the interesting results that, that we uh, obtained recently, for example, was to show that, well, th this rotational excitation that I'm talking about specifically uh, is, is equivalent to the Frankel exciton in molecular crystals. Okay, now we show that if you, if you say have a system of diatomic molecules, for example, trapped in an optical lattice, and you generate those rotational Frankel excitons in, in those uh, molecular ensembles, and you subject them to an electric field, you can actually make those rotational excitons form bound pairs. And this is something that will never happen in natural crystals for reasons I'm not going to go in, into uh, right now. And so I'm not going to talk about that. But what I'm going to talk about instead is, is an even more significant application of uh, what, what we call rotational Frankel excitons. And that's the, the uh, potential use of, of them for the simulation of uh, polarized physics in what we call in, 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 in new interaction regimes. And I'm going to um, explain in a moment what I mean here. Okay. Now, a polaron is a particle, <coughs> like an electron, coupled to a uh, bosonic field, like a field of phonons in a crystal, for example. <coughs> and you know, there's actually different, different kinds of polarons uh, that 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 uh, you know describe the behavior of say electrons in different kinds of crystals. For example, if you have an electron moving in an ionic crystal, okay. So if the crystal is completely unperturbed, you know, there's translational symmetry and and the electron is simply the block wave, right? But if you now let the ions vibrate, so what this translational motion of the ions is going to do is going to induce interactions that will localize the electron, right? So uh, the, the interaction between the electron and the vibrational motion of the phonons uh, uh, of the ions is going to affect, uh, to, to lead to the uh, quasi-particle that, that is called the polaron, uh, whose mass is going to be uh, increasing as the interaction, the coupling uh, strength between the electron and the phonons increases. And this is described most primitively by the so-called Holstein polaron model, which is, you know, the Hamiltonian for the Holstein polaron is um, is uh, written on the on the slide. Now imagine uh, imagine now a different <laughs> system, a conjugated polyene, in which again electrons are free to move because you have double bonds alternating with single bonds, right? So you have the uh, the orbitals perpendicular to the plane of the drawing, they overlap, so the electron, so these, these, these kind of uh, systems are used for organic semiconductors, right? So I have electrons flowing, uh, <coughs> you know, uh, in, in this kind of system, and again, uh, uh, the, the, these electrons, the, the flow of the electrons, the electron transport is going to be perturbed by the translational motion of the nuclei, except that in this case there are no ions, right? 
<coughs> so what the translational motion in this case is going to do is going to help the electrons move between different lattice sites as opposed to localizing it because you know you imagine what the vibrational motion can do it can bring the different lattice sites closer together right so it's going to make it easier for the electrons to actually hop between different lattice sites and this kind of behavior is described by a different color model it's called the sue schrieffer hager model and again the specific form of the hamiltonian for this model is this okay there are other kinds of models that people use uh for uh but you know these are the two limiting uh sort of cases okay now we were just inspired by all the latest experimental developments with uh, uh, trapping molecules on an optical lattice, and this is the uh, picture from a uh, recent, recent nature paper of June here. Yeah. So what they can do now is load molecules on an optical lattice with, with one uh, molecule <coughs> per lattice side, okay? and, and, and the molecules are interacting uh, with each other. Now, what they did in this paper it, it was exactly what I, what I uh, proposed to do in, in one of the earlier slides. They, they, they rotationally excited molecules, and they, and they observed the transfer of that rotational excitation between different molecules. Okay, what they didn't consider in in this of course, study is the interaction of that excitation, uh, uh, you know, with the translation motion of the molecules. They didn't have to because they had a very strong trapping potential. But if you now make the trapping potential a bit shallower, you let the molecules uh, vibrate in the, in the trapping potential. So that rotational excitation that's traveling between the molecules, it will be interacting, and we showed that in, in, in the paper that I uh, just cited. <coughs> so that, that rotational excitation will be interacting with the uh, translational motion of the molecules. And if you go through the derivation of the Hamiltonian that describes this, this uh, process, it turns out that the, the, the Hamiltonian is going to be uh, well, that's just the interaction part of the Hamiltonian. It's going to be the, 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 the exciton part, the, 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 the part that describes the rotational excitation that's propagating throughout the crystal. Then it's going to be the phonon part that describes the vibrational motion of the molecules in the lattice potential. And it's going to be a, this part here, which is actually a combination of the colston polaron coupling, uh, given by the first time, and the SSH polaron. Uh, coupling, you know, the, 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 the uh, coupling that describes the propagation of electrons in this kind of system. And that's given by the second uh, term here. So what you have here, really, is a system, well, because, you know, you, you're not dealing with an electron propagating here, you're dealing with it with an, ex uh, well, with a, with an excitation propagating, so your, your bare particle is now not an electron, but an excitation, but it doesn't matter. In, in the language of second quantization, we're, we're working with closer particles anyway, so all we care about is this you know, creation annihilation operators. Okay, but formally what you're dealing with here is a generic polaron model that includes both types of couplings, the Holstein type or the, you know, uh, uh, couplings and the, the SSH type couplings. And even more importantly, uh, we showed that by applying an electric field, these, these constants here, the, the, the coupling constants, they, they can actually be tuned uh, all the way from zero for the G sub D uh, constant to some like 30 kilohertz uh, for an ensemble of lithium cesium molecules and an optical lattice. So it doesn't matter what molecules you're dealing with. You know, the, the, this is just to illustrate the typical magnitude of those couplings. So as you can see, the ratio of the uh, these two couplings, so the ratio of the two terms that describe the coupling of the bare particle with the phonon field can be tuned by simply varying the magnitude of the electric field. Okay, so you can start looking at the phase diagram of those uh, polarons, and, and this is for uh, you know the, the phase diagram for a single polaron described by this uh, mixed model. So what I'm plotting here is the <coughs> the areas of the ground uh, of the of the minimum of the ground state as a function of the uh, coupling strength uh, uh, and the uh, <coughs> This, this beta, so this beta and uh, alpha are the uh, the ratio of those parameters. I've relabeled them, but they're the ratio of those parameters g sub j and g sub t. Okay, so uh, going to the to the right in this 
phase di uh, diagram, you're going to the limit, I apologize for renaming the model here, so this model is actually not exactly the Holstein model, but it's, a, it's very similar to the Holstein model, okay, so it's a breathing mode model. In any case, going to the right in this diagram, you're going to go to the limit of this uh, breathing mode uh, polarant model, and, go to, and, and near zero in this phase diagram, you're in the limit of the, of the SSH polarant model. Okay, now, if you look at the phase diagram of just the Holstein polarant, and it's very boring, there's actually no lines on that phase diagram. Remember I, I mentioned that if you, if you increase the, the interaction strength between the, the bare particle and the bosonic field, uh, the Holstein polarant becomes heavier. And, and, and the transition from, from a light polarant in the regime of weak coupling to the localized polarant in the regime of strong coupling is actually a, you know, a smooth crossover. There are no transitions. Uh, uh, you know, between these two different limits. Now, in the case of the of this mixed model, there are actually two transitions that are represented by these lines here. They correspond to the to non-analyticities and the uh, energy of the polarons. Okay. So what what this uh, illustrates is that the physics of uh, uh, you know described by this kind of mixed model is actually much more interesting. Than, than the physics uh, of uh, simple polarized models or solid type models. Okay, this is just a summary of this part of my five minutes I have. Okay, uh, then maybe I I, I, sh I should go over this very briefly because there's another thing I wanted to point out uh, <coughs> that 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 may be very interesting to do with molecules trapped in an optical lattice because if you think about it. The unique picture of so if you look at molecules on optical lattice, it, it resembles like like a crystal, right? It's it's an artificial crystal. It's maybe an ordered system, or you know if you have vacancies, uh, you know it's a disordered crystal, right? But what makes this uh, system unique is that the molecules in the in the uh, in the lattice they're separated by a very large distance, typically larger than 400 nanometers. Okay, what that means is that you can in principle come in with a with a focused laser and if you know, and you can in principle address molecules in different lattice sites. Maybe not in a single lattice site, but in a small number of lattice sites. So you can apply perturbations that are uh, lattice site specific. Okay. So we thought, you know, to uh, look into the possibility of using this uh, in order to study the prospect of of uh, controlling the transport of those kind of excitations that I already mentioned in the in in, in these types of crystals. Okay. Now, just like I mentioned before, rotational excitations in, in uh, molecules such as optical lattice, they're, very, they're analogous, they're completely equivalent to electronic excitations in molecular crystals, like in a crystal of naphthalene. The, uh, the, those kind of excitations, they're frank electrons and they're described by, uh, by the wave function of these forms. So it's basically a coherent superposition of uh, this kind of product states in which the excitation is sitting in a particular lattice site, and you're summing over n here. So what you've got here is, a, is, a, is an excitation that's localized over the entire uh, crystal, and so it's, it's a it's, it's a uh, it's a wave-like excitation. Okay. Now, uh, if you want to control this kind of delocalized wave-like excitations, there's two things you may want to be able to do. One is to focus those delocalized excitations onto particular parts of the crystal, and the other is to shift the, uh, the uh, localized excitations from one part of the crystal to another. Okay. So to achieve complete control over uh, transport of excitations, quantum excitations, and this kind of systems, again, you, what you want is to focus and shift. Now, focusing is uh, simple. You know, understanding the uh, way to focus is actually not that uh, difficult, because if you think about an excitation, so and, and what I'm doing here, I'm, I'm writing the state for a for an ex, you know for an excitation in the most general possible form, right? So it can be most general written as a coherence of proposition of exciton states with different momentum k. Okay, and now these expansion coefficients here are of course just that. And if you look at this at the wave function at, at the state for the excitation written like this you realize that if you were to take this, uh, you know, uh, so act this wave packet and if you wanted to move it in momentum space uh, to 
another value of k, what you would have to do is to simply add a phase to, uh, you know, uh, to that, that would be actually lattice side independent. Okay, so this can be achieved by simply coming in with a uh, laser uh, pulse that would perturb the structure of molecules sitting in those, on all these different lattice sites uh, transiently, right? So, and the interesting thing about it is that you don't really need to uh, keep that perturbation on. You come in with a pulse, you turn it on and off, and that will introduce a phase, uh, you know, to be added here, and that will shift the the the, uh, the this wave packet, the, the accident wave packet, in momentum representation to well, like so, actually. Uh, so again, you know, if you start with an excitation that's localized around k zero, around zero momentum in momentum space, by applying the phase transformation, by applying simply a, uh, a, a lattice, well, applying a laser pulse that perturbs the molecules sitting in different lattice sites, uh, you know, uh, transiently, you can do this. You can shift the, uh, the wave packet in momentum space. So, you know, if, it, if the wave packet is, is centered around zero, because it's not moving, uh, shifting it over uh, to this part of the, the momentum space is going to make it move. And, you know, if you look at it in coordinate space, that's what it's going to do. Okay. Uh, 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 this, this slide illustrates the procedure for focusing those excitations. Again, if you want to focus, you know, uh, the idea, uh, you know, uh, for how to focus those excitations uh, can be inspired by looking at what happens as, a, uh, as light passes through a prism, right? So when, when, you know, when you focus light, what you really do, you take those different K components and you give them different phase, in this case quadratic phase, and that will make the, the uh, wave focus onto a particular uh, a, a spot at a particular distance away from the lens. So now translate it into the language I'm using now. This would uh, be applying a quadratic, uh, well, this would be applying a transit perturbation that would be a quadratic function of the lattice side to the ensemble of molecules sitting in an optical lattice. So imagine coming in with a Gaussian laser pulse, and Gaussian pulse is quadratic at the at the bottom, right? So, so you can, so imagine starting with a with a collective excitation that that's delocalized over the entire crystal. It looks like this, and then you come in with a laser pulse, Gaussian laser pulse, that that uh, again that that is on for a very short time. It perturbs the molecules, giving them a, a, a phase, and we call it the taking phase transformation. Uh, and, and and if you then let the, the those excitations evolve naturally, uh, you know, then depending on on where the minimum of that Gaussian uh, you know, uh, sh Gaussian shape laser field uh, is positioned, you're going to get something like this, right? So you can basically choose where to localize your delocalized excitation. Roman, may I ask a uh, uh -huh. terminological question? I understood you a uh, delocalized state. It was a block state, really, in crystal, yeah? Delocalized excitation. Mm -hmm. uh, if you use pulse and then you uh, state represented by small phase volume. Is it a one-year type of wave function? What is this here? Because you may delocalize, make a localized or vice versa, depending on the laser. This all localized state, is it one-year state for crystal or not? Well, all I'm doing here, I'm shaping the wave packet <coughs> of the localized states, right? And, and like I said, you know, if you have a wave packet and you understand quantum mechanics, you can, you can Shape them whatever way you, it can be represented. You know, it, it could you shape them in one specific lattice? You can, question. yeah, you can. I mean, th there's a limit of what you can do, really. But, 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 you know, you, you probably couldn't focus it on a specific on one single lattice side, but maybe on a couple of three lattice sides. You know, and uh, using one year states, you know, as a basis. You know, you're, you're free to choose whatever states you want yeah. as a basis, right? But it's just you chose the beta set, right? So what I'm talking about here is physics, and the physics is really. A, uh, in the shaping of those collective excitations by, by transient laser pulses. Okay. That's what I'm trying to uh, say. Uh, and, I, and I have a couple of animations that are also beautiful. And so, well, uh, again, what, what this shows is the dynamics of that collective excitation after uh, a short laser pulse. And again, everything that's happening here, even the absence of the laser field, you know, and uh, 
and by simply choosing the by simply moving the the uh, position of the minimum of that laser field that you're applying, you, you can again focus the excitation onto different parts of the lattice. So it also works in the in, you know in disordered lattices. Of course, you know all, all I showed you before was just for an ideal crystal, but you know in experiments you're going to have to work with lattices in which many of the lattice sites are empty. Uh, so these are this can be viewed as disordered crystals, and and you know uh, and again uh, you can work out the conditions. Uh, for the phase transformations that you can apply to actually take this kind of an excitation in a lattice where the black dots represent now it's a two dimensional lattice with the black dots representing back insists you can take this kind of a, an excitation and you can apply that transformation to make it do to make it do that basically to make it assemble all of the excitation probability to a, a small number of lattice sets and that's just the animation of what you disorder uh, well, I feel it's, oh, I'm not going to say anything about this. I'm just going to uh, uh, again conclude with thanking, uh, well, first of all, uh, the ITAM and uh, Alex Delgarna, John Doyle, Hussein, and Kate. Uh, these are the people who, in particular, these are the people who have, uh, you know, the most transformative impact on me. The work I've been presenting today. A lot of it was done by Felipe Herrera, who's actually sitting, he's in the audience, he's sitting right there. He's a postdoc with Alan Asperu Guzik now, and uh, some other students as well. It was also a collaboration with Kirk Madison and Mona Berchu, uh, both of whom are in the physics department at UBC. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. you have any questions for Roman? Yes. So for this pulse shaping and the disordered lattice, do you need to know exactly where the vacancies are? Well, uh, not really. So the way uh, the way you, you would figure out the conditions uh, for the phase transformations, you would start with the localized state and you let it propagate backwards in time. And you know, and that, and uh, given a particular uh, realization of disorder, right? So so you would need some sort of an optimal control scheme. To figure out the 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 uh, specific uh, phase transformation that you need to apply, but it's fairly robust to the uh, dif different disorder realizations, right? So you can actually so what we showed is that you can split that big crystal into blocks, and then you can apply you know a constant phase to a particular block of the crystal. And this is the method that's called you may have heard it, it's called the T matrix method. You know the, the you know, they use it in spectroscopy. You know, the idea there is to, well, I probably shouldn't go into that. But, you know, uh, yeah, so, so what I'm saying is that you theoretically can figure out the conditions by simply propagating your state backwards in time, and experimentally you would need to have some sort of an optimal of no control feedback loop. And, uh, but luckily, like I said, the, the, the schemes are uh, fairly, Robust, uh, you know, with respect to different disorder realizations. Yes, so, I guess uh, for some of these controls to occur to the middle system, uh, it has to be in the pure state to start with. That yeah, so, so there's no decoherence. And uh, also, it, uh, because you are looking for this excitation transfer. They have to be basically in the lowest block band. Yes. So that means each of them. You don't uh, have to be, but but you know, it's, you know, it's just easier. To, I mean, the calculations I presented were. Well, for the yeah, lowest. Yeah, for the lowest. Uh, and but so you know, how how close uh, this KRB uh, uh, Oh, in the KRB experiments, they can measure. Uh, they, they can actually see these excitation columns between different lattice sites. I mean, their lattice site, they, they work uh, with three dimensional lattices you know, uh, with a population of about 20%. So, there's about 20% of the lattice sites are populated by molecules, which they claim means that you know, every molecule is interacting with a pair of other molecules. And they can actually look at the, the, those excitations hopping between the molecules, whether it's classical hopping or quantum mechanical. Uh, as, you know, so you need quantum mechanics to do what I'm proposing here. So it basically has to be a coherent state that that that, that evolves in time, 
you know, uh, so if you have decoherence, of course, you know, then, then those many body uh, excited states will collapse to a local state, and then, then you know, it's just going to be like the particle class of particle hopping. So what, what's happening in their experiment is not entirely sure. Uh, but as, you know, as you remove, as the experiments progress to uh, become more precise and, and they remove the, you know, decoherence sources, you know, it should be possible to do what I'm proposing here. Okay. I think we got to move on to the next speaker. So I thank Roman. Yeah.